donc, euh, good morning, euh, Kalimera, buenos dias, euh, bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue. Uh, I would like to welcome all the attendants to this, uh, to this webinar by Professor Rick Serrano, <coughs> having as title, The Walls of El Prado Museum are talking to you. And this is the third uh, conference of a series connecting the worlds of audit and, and art. Today, uh, different uh, artworks from the masters of El Prado Museum, like Velázquez, Murillo, El Greco, and others, will serve us as a tool to talk about five concepts which are key to the court. Accountability, sustainability, teamwork, ethics, and respect. I would like to thank Mr. Milionis, member of the court, in his quality of chairman of the working group in charge of creating and developing an art policy for the court, for sponsoring this conference, and for his efforts supporting the use of art as a management tool. Mr. Milionis will be introducing today this conference and our speaker, Rick Serrano. A special thanks go to Dimitrios Lovacis, our colleague, uh, for his efforts in organizing uh, this, this conference. Allow me before we start to go over some uh, important housekeeping points. You already know, please keep your micros and cameras switch off when you are not intervening. And you can ask questions and uh, at any moment, please write them in the chat. At the end of the presentation, there's going to be a debate and I will be addressing all the questions which are in the chat. The conference, as you know, will be recorded and uh, the PowerPoint presentation and the recording will be made available to all ACA staff after the conference. <coughs> now I would like to pass the floor to Mr. Milionis. Many thanks, Haristopoli, Calimera, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Alfonso. Uh, good, after, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Rick Serrano, uh, for this training event about how the Museo del Prado walls are talking to us. Uh, I would like first to express my warmest thanks uh, to him for accepting our invitation. I would also like uh, uh, to thank you, Alfonso, and my friend Dimitrios and my compatriot Dimitrios for uh, their help in organizing this presentation. Alfonso will chair this event. Uh, uh, he is the project manager uh, for the new upcoming ECA art policy. Uh, he has, uh, as we know, uh, he has written a master, uh, his master thesis on the use of uh, art as uh, a management tool. As you know, art is an unlimited source of inspiration. The walls of the Museo del Prado are full of beauty. They convey universal values and teach us lessons from our past. Rick Serrano will use some of the Spain, Spain's most famous paintings to catch our attention, uh, stimulate uh, our reflection and draw lessons on key management concepts we apply in our daily work. At the court, we also plan to inspire people using art. We are proposing to set up an art panel who will uh, develop a policy around our key institutional values and bring life to our walls. We will uh, do so progressively and with not ambition to match the beauty of the walls of the Prado Museum. But at our modest level, we plan to develop staff well-being -being, well -being and to, pro to promote a sense of community around a more welcome uh, workplace. Uh, this is particularly important after the long period of crisis we just went through. We have shown our resilience and flexibility and achieved remarkable res results, but at the same time, maintaining regular contacts beyond our closest, uh, closest uh, callings has been a challenge. Art may inspire us, bring us together and guide us uh, towards a brighter future. Now, a few words for on our speaker. Uh, Rick Serrano holds an, an MBA from Harvard Business School and is an international public speaker. 
Uh, he works currently as head of knowledge sharing and coaching at Generali Luxembourg. Uh, Rick Serrano has a financial background as chief financial officer of uh, Schindler Mexico during five years. And in addition, he was during three years financial controller in, um, in, for Generali in Milan. Rick is a certified coach by Cambridge University and he has done executive and life coaching for uh, people in eight countries in Europe and the Americas. He has more than 20 years, 12 years, sorry, 12 years of studies in philosophy in various universities. Rick Serrano is an author of, uh, is the author of the book Next Destination Go and the creator of the Luxembourg model of innovation. The Luxembourg, the Luxembourg model of governance, as well as the picky picky cherry picking theory. Rick is a founding member of the Luxembourg uh, Freedom Initiative, a nonprofit fighting modern slavery. He sits on the board of the organization Ami de l'Université de Luxembourg and that of the international Kunstverein Luxembourg. In addition, Rick is an active painter uh, since two, 2005, uh, having exhibited in various cities in Europe. He created an art exhibition, The Limits of Our World, explaining, explaining the works of Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. I'm, now I'm looking forward to Rick Serrano inspiring and stimulating presentation. I would like to hand back the floor to Alfonso. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Milionis, uh, uh, for this very nice presentation. I will ask you to point out that uh, um, Mr. Savano will now uh, start the conference. And please, uh, I ask all the audience to use actively the chat to start putting any kind of questions and to make this a lively event. So please uh, feel free to use the chat. Uh, Rick, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alfonso. Thank you very much. And thank you to Mr. Milionis for that uh, very nice uh, introduction. Uh, for me, it's an honor to be here with you today. Uh, it's my second time with the ECA and it's truly a privilege to, to be with you today. So uh, a, a big thanks to Mr. Milionis for the invitation. And of course, also to Dimitrios Vavatsis and Alfonso de la Fuente for uh, trusting me in uh, Taking, taking one hour of your precious time. I know you are very busy people and that you have a lot of sessions to attend. So a special thanks to you. But let me tell you that um, this is not just a normal thank you that I want to give you. I want to give you a special opening thank you because uh, not only for being here present, but because you are being open to new approaches and new techniques to, ch to share knowledge, and uh, that is what we're trying to do here. So this is sort of an experiment, and I hope that you can enjoy it. I will uh, try to go very quickly uh, through the slides, uh, but of course, as Alfonso said, uh, feel free to just put any question in the chat, and we will have time for Q&A at the end. So uh, I, I, I hope uh, really that you like it, because the presentation is a little bit of a a, a new experiment that um, that I give to art to try and use art to derive some uh, values of the corporate world. So let's see if we can do that. Uh, I hope uh, that that you can open your minds and open your your expectations to see and discover new things. So basically, let me show you what I have prepared for today. I will be starting by giving you a little bit about, you know, technical information that might be useful to you uh, if you go to El Prado. I've noticed that there are several Spanish colleagues in the call. For those of you, might be a little bit obvious, but maybe for the rest of, 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 of us, no. So I thought I'd bring you some hints on that. And then I will try to explain you how I build the link between art and the corporate world. And then I will go into very quickly touching on to five different uh, painters. So let me also uh, tell you, as uh, Mr. As, as Mr. Milonis mentioned, I have a, a past uh, in, in a previous life. I was a, a finance person, so I was uh, very frequently dealing with auditors and I know how challenging and how difficult sometimes your work can be. 
I have a lot of respect for auditors because you really need to find the truth and, and, and illuminate. And, and I'm, I'm going to try to be making the presentation specially dedicated to you at the ECA. So hopefully we can we can do that. So let's get it started. I'm going to start, as I said, by telling you a little bit about El Prado. Well, you know, El Prado is, apart from being a very important museum, it's a beautiful building uh, in, the, in, in downtown Madrid. The architect was Juan de Villanueva, who in 1785 designed and built this beautiful uh, museum in Spain. And the, the museum, of course, he has a lot of works. It has works from Bosch, Rubens, Tiziano, Mantegna, uh, Tintoretto, Durer, you name it. It has a lot of art. It has, just to give you some dimension, it has more than 8,000 paintings, something like 9,000 drawings, 5,000 prints, and close to 1,000 sculptures. And pre-COVID, they were getting a, around 3 million visitors a year. So that's a lot of visitors. It, it, it's, it's a very impressive museum. You, some of you might know it. Well, um, the museum had a big jump in the 16th century when uh, Carlos V uh, um, basically donated the collection. And then the other kings also uh, put their collections there, like the Habsburgs, like the Bourbons. And, and it has been always all this wealth, all this art wealth conserved, preserved in this beautiful building. During the Civil War, by the way, eh, the, the works were moved to Valencia to protect them, but normally they have been there for, for many times. Just, just to give you a, a, a location, you know, it's in downtown Madrid, close to the Botanical Garden and close to the Parque del Retiro, very conveniently located for you to visit. As you will have the presentation later, I thought I, I give you some information that could be useful, you know, on the hours and the times uh, and the days that you can visit. It's, there is an important gratuity uh, happening two hours before the closure, so maybe you want to consider that for a trip. So, you know, I thought maybe this could be useful for you. Now, the museum has uh, four beautiful doors uh, called, each and every one called, uh, after the names of the painters, so you will have the Murillo door, you will have the Velasquez uh, gate and the Goya gate. And um, it's really the museum in itself very nice. The line normally forms here, big line, you know how it is. And then you go here and you get your tickets here and then you enter by the Puerta Los Jerónimos. So the museum, why do I show you this? I show you this because I want to give you an idea for those of you who don't know the museum. I want to give you an idea of how big the museum is. And you know what? It can be a little bit overwhelming. You know, you might go there and say, God, three, three floors full of paintings and sculptures. And you might get tired. So uh, what, what I sometimes do is when I take uh, gr groups of people to visit the museum, either this or the other big museums like Louvre, like Lufizzi, etc. What I do is I do sometimes what I call a, a surgeon's visit. A surgeon's visit means that uh, in my in my vocabulary means that I open the museum, I enter, get what I want, then I go out and close it, right? Just to give you the, an, a bit of essence of the museum. Now let me show you what I uh, what I normally do when I take people here. So I start by entering uh, through the through the main gate uh, on this side, and then I go and see the the Greco paintings here. Then I move and see the uh, Zurbarán. Then I see Velázquez. Then I go and see the Murillos. Then I go downstairs and visit the Black Goya. And before I get depressed, then I take the lift to the third floor and then I visit what I call the Joyful Goya. A little bit of that is what I'm going to show you today. And let's see if you can like it. Now, uh, before that, of course, we are here for a reason. So let me try to tell you, let me try to share with you what uh, where, where's the link, or at least in my in my view, where where the link is between art and the corporate world in general? But in particular, I'm going to try to be focusing on on auditors, which is what matters today. So, of course, you know that art is created for beauty, but not only. Not only. There are other reasons for that. And if anybody of you attended, uh, for example, the Luxembourg Art Week a couple of weekends ago, you can you can testify this, that there is a lot of art which is not created for beauty, right? And art is created most of the times to communicate. Art is about communicating ideas, 
thoughts, feelings, beliefs. For me, it's about communicating passion. And what I want to uh, transmit to you, hopefully, this morning is that there is a lot of passion in art. And hopefully, you can get this passion. You can enjoy this passion uh, with me and with your fellow auditors. And maybe, maybe discover something more than the beauty of the paintings and maybe take take some, some little lessons home that can be useful in your daily life. So the invitation today for you is to stay not only with the beauty of art, but really to go and extract its full value. That's my invitation to you. So I, I underline really the fact that, uh, you know, you can have a full value extracted out of here right now. Uh, let me make you a, an example so a, a very simple artwork like this one uh, by Rothko you know it's a very simple uh, thing and some some people even tell me Rick is that art I mean is that supposed to be art I just see a couple of squares and some yellow um, well that's the point you need to make a little bit of an effort to uh, get get what is beyond the evidence right now all of the pieces of art are trying to communicate you something either from originally the painter, or even if that was not the intention of the painter originally, you yourself might discover something. And that's for me the most important part. So I will not be talking to you about how Velasquez wanted to say something for you auditors. No, I'm not talking, I, I would not venture into that, but I want to invite you to try and discover something that you find in the pieces of art. Now, if, if something like Rotkos can tell you that, Imagine what the masters can communicate. So the big, big masters like Velázquez and Goya and so forth. So the masters of the Prado, in my, in my view, they have a lot to offer us. They have a lot to give you and you can discover really a lot. So let me tell you something. Everything that I'm saying, folks, everything that I'm telling you, I understand you might find it kitsch. I understand you might find it, you know, um, a little bit, uh, come on, Rick, you're, you're, you're pushing it too hard. Well, maybe yes, maybe yes, maybe that's the case. But I invite you to listen with all your senses. So when you look at a piece of art, I invite you to try and discover not only what the evidence is, but really to make an effort. And of course, as they say, uh, watch the uh, and see with your heart and with the rest of your senses to really allow the masterpiece of art to sort of get into you get into your brain, get into your heart, get into your feelings. That's the point. Now, you folks are auditors. You are auditors. So you are used to this. You are used to extracting the truth. And this is, in this sense, you have a very particular advantage versus the classical people visiting a museum because you are auditors. You are used to going places and finding out, extracting the truth. And that is why you are so advantage in discovering the the maybe not evident senses of art now let me tell you what i you you as auditors are experts also in reading between the lines and what i want you to try and do is precisely that read between the line of the artwork that that's the point so this is like using a periscope right uh, you as auditors you are trained and you are experts in seeing beyond the truth, seeing beyond the evidence. No, I might see at naked eye, I might see something in, uh, at sea, but if I use the, the telescope, then I can see something more. And you have that training. So that is the exciting part, I think. So the five masters will guide us, the five masters that I show you, and we will be searching for five values. So the five masters are these five, El Greco, Zurbarán, Murillo, Goya, and Velázquez. And the five values that Alfonso de la Fuente anticipated to us that I am trying to spot are accountability, sustainability, respect, teamwork, and ethics. Now, this is, of course, not a one-to-one -one correlation. I would never try to force that. This is just maybe just some inspiration and maybe just some raindrops of values spread across the, the, the walls of the Museo del Prado. Now, to do this, I'm going to use something that I call the reverse engineering technique for art. The reverse engineering technique is, I first will tell you about the paintings from an artistic point of view for a given painter, and then I will come back, I sort of rewind, and I will tell you what I see for the corporate world. So this is a list of painters. Let me get started with El Greco. So El Greco, 
uh, whose name was Domenicos Teotocopoulos, but of course nobody could pronounce that beautiful name when he got to Spain, so they just said, oh, he's from Greece, let's call him El Greco, easy. So, Renaissance painter, um, he, had, he has no formal school, no formal style from the classical uh, catalogs of names, but he's known as a tenebrism. And so his education is important. He started first in Byzantium, then uh, he lived in Creta until 26, and then he moved to Venice. And in Venice, he learned uh, from Tiziano, he learned from Tintoretto, and then more importantly, he went to Rome, where he learned from Michelangelo, and then he moved to Toledo, where he, he had basically the climax of his career. So a very special uh, painter. And uh, I want to show you, I'm going to show you some of his paintings. Now, let me tell you, I'm going to be showing you some paintings or, or several paintings that have religious themes, religious topics. But we're not going to be focusing on the religious part. So is, is it relevant whether you have faith or not? It's completely relevant for this discussion. Just bear with me to try and, and show you the art part and then the corporate part. So let me start very quickly with El Greco. So. El Greco has always these kind of paintings that go, you know, first of all, they are like vertical paintings. Uh, most of them, they have like like an axis going from the top to the bottom and the development of your, your view will go that way. They are characterized by a lot of uh, what is called the chiaroscuro, so the dark and the light in big contrast. Now, notice how El Greco is a master of the use of light. See, the, he puts the light where he wants to give uh, strength to the images, and then he puts the black or the dark behind that in a very dramatic way. So take a look, it's not like the classical painting where of course you have shadows and so, this is very dramatic whites and darks on the other side. So that is uh, something that I want you to notice. I also want you to notice that by doing that, he shows a lot the muscles of the of the bodies. He shows a lot of the strength of the body. And also, you see how he plays with the flexibility of the body, right? It sort of bends like this, no? And by using that, he also is able to show a lot of strength. Here, for example, you see Saint Sebastian. By the way, every time you see a painting of a guy like this with the arrows, you can tell that that's Saint Sebastian. That's how we recognize him. Uh, take a look how strong the legs are and how strong the biceps and the triceps are. That's because he's using that chiaroscuro with such a mastery. And uh, also, again, you know, the verticality of the paintings, the light coming from the top, and so the muscles of the uh, of the figures, the colors, the contrasting colors, you know, that's what we see here. Here you can see, for example, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, you will always recognize him because he's wearing the fur uh, of, a, of a lamb and also because he has this long cross. So John the Baptist here, take a look at the dra drama that he's able to create El Greco by using those colors. So that's a little bit the point. Now, let me go back. So let's do the reverse. So that's a little bit about the art, but let me now go back and tell you a little bit what I see here, because I think El Greco can have a lot of lessons for us, especially a lot of lessons for auditors. So for me here, the use of the light the use of the light is beautiful because you as auditors, when you go into a, into, a, into a job, you basically bring the light from top to bottom. You basically bring the illumination of things. You shed light and, and you bring that and, and hopefully you bring clarity where you go and, and do your work. But by focusing, of course, following some rules, of course, you illuminate that. Now, look at the chiaroscuro and see how the different colors contracts, contrast. Well, that for me also tells me about harmony. And harmony also for me result, results, look at the harmony of the figures, how they are created by the colors, by El Greco. But that for me also means harmony. And harmony is important because it, that is important for adaptability, it's important for resilience, it's important for acceptance, it's important even for teamwork, of course. No? So these are the kind of things that, that I get reminded uh, as a somebody who works in business but loves art. Here, for example, no, you can see there is a, here's what, what we effectively have here is like sort of a, a hierarchy, right? We see this, this could be like almost like, like an organizational chart 
with you know where you need to follow rules where you need to follow uh, an organizational order and, and you have to of course respect your teams respect your boss res respect the staff respect of course the audits and you need to have and find that balance find that equili equilibrium so look how in the in art this equilibrium is shown now there's something else that you as auditors should also have i guess you as auditors need the strength, but also the flexibility. Take a look at the figures, how they are flexible. So to some extent, you also can bring this as a, as a memory for flexibility, flexibility of mind while following the rules, following the methodology. I also follow the order of things. And at the same time, I am very strong because the strength of numbers, the strength of evidence is like the muscles here in St. Sebastian. Huh? And so you have the strength on one side, but the flexibility and the adaptability and the resilience on the other side. Same here. No? Uh, take a look at the strength of the figures. Take a look at the illumination. So that's it for El Greco. That's our first painter. Now let me change and show you just, just a big cap capsule of pure art. This is not to give you any lesson, but this is the most famous painting of El Greco. It's called The Burial of the Count of Orgas. And this is a, a, a noble mind, a noble mind, man from Toledo uh, being buried by St. Augustine and St. Stephen. And this is a, a very nice uh, painting that you can see in Toledo uh, if you ever visit. This is not at El Prado, although there is a copy, a rip, not a copy, a reproduction at El Prado. You can, you can admire it. Now, let me change gears a little bit. And now let me pass to Zurbaran. Zurbaran is a very special painter, and I have uh, just just a couple of uh, dates about him. So Zurbaran, uh, 1598, 1664. He was he's a very special guy. He was a you know from is what, what we call a golden century painter. His school is Manierism. Uh, he is sometimes called the Spanish Caravaggio, also for the use of the chiaroscuro, and he's a little bit going away from realism to use more, they are called like acid colors. And uh, he, of course, he has a lot of uh, religious works and that is simply not because he was especially religious, but you know, people uh, from the church in those years were the ones who had the money, so were the ones who were commissioning the, the, the works. And he, uh, he started in Sevilla, then moved to Madrid. Then he became friend of Velázquez and so forth. Uh, and even became um, a, a friend of Velázquez, who was, uh, of course, the painter of the king. By the way, Zurbarán married four times, and each time he married a rich widow. So, you know, he was also financially intelligent in, in, in amassing a nice fortune. Now, I bring you two paintings. Let me give you the artistic part. So the first painting that I bring you is this beautiful Agnus Dei. Agnus Dei, uh, you might probably know, means the Lamb of God. And I want you to admire this piece of art because, I mean, I'll let you watch it for a second. You can sort of even sense the weight of the animal there. You, know? you can sense how he is tied in the legs, but he is with the head there. And you can almost feel the, 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 the hair of the animal, how he's lying there without moving. But at the same time, he's still alive, right? I think it's a beautiful painting. And let me show you another painting. This painting is called The Apparition of St. Peter to St. Peter Nolasco. So this is St. Peter, the one that you know from, from the, the, the disciple of Jesus. And this one is St. Peter Nolasco. So let me tell you the story. St. Peter Nolasco, who lived in Spain, was always w wishing and hoping to be allowed to go to Rome. He wanted to go to the Vatican. And his superiors would not allow him to go. So he was always asking, please, please let me go to the Vatican. And they would say, no, no, no. So one day he's praying and praying God to let him go to uh, the Vatican. And then he has the, uh, some, his, his patron saint, St. Peter, appears to him uh, and he says, hey, um, accept, accept what it is. Just, just take what it is and don't fight with it. It's just learn the message. So th those are the messages artistic. Of course, here you can admire from Zurbaran. You can admire how he paints the muscles, how he paints the, the body. You can definitely tell that he has learned from the from the Italian masters. That's the beauty. And you can also see the chiaroscuro once again repeating here. Now, 
let's see what messages do I take from this. So what are the couple of messages that I uh, get from these two paintings? First of all, let me tell you about uh, the Agnus Day, and I want you to focus on the face of the animal. The face of the animal uh, for me means acceptance, and for me means also respect. Uh, for me, respect is acceptance of the other's personality, and, and it's also acceptance um, with, uh, you know, accepting the others with their mistakes, with their defects, with their troubles, and don't fight with those differences, but respect them. I think this is also important in light of the in light of the disability week that you are uh, going through now, and also in in light of the importance of um, um, uh, inclusion, diversity, and inclusion, because this is like acceptance of other people's differences. And what I see in the face of this beautiful animal is also, you know, I don't judge. I can accept and I don't judge. I listen and I am open to other people. Also here, when St. Peter, uh, the disciple tells St. Peter Nolasco says, accept what is maybe different from you. Well, in this context also, you know, once again, for me, this is uh, respect. Uh, respect meaning occasional, not always, of course, but occasional surrender to our own expectations, to our own, own ambitions. But why would you do that? For the sake of the greater good. So uh, th this is important. So you accept, but not as a defeat, not as a surrender, not as a failure, but for the sake of the higher good. In the context, for example, of diversity and inclusion, acceptance of the others means also accept them and accept their difference, even if I don't like them. That's a little bit the point that I take from here, from uh, Thurbaran. Now, let's go to our third uh, painter, Murillo. Now, Murillo, uh, Esteban Murillo, Bartolomé Esteban Murillo, 1617, 1682. He is a, a, a classical from the Baroque, Spanish Baroque, uh, sometimes labeled as Illuminism, sometimes labeled as Naturalism, sometimes touching Rococo. He was one of the masters of the School of Sevilla. And, and it's important that you think of Sevilla in those years. So Sevilla, back in the, in the 1600s, of course, is a very, very rich city. They are receiving all the gold and all the silver and all the, all the wealth coming from, from Latin America and from the colonies. So it's, it's a very, very rich city. And that's where he grew up. And uh, after achieving some success, uh, he, went, um, he went and created, uh, he opened a painting and drawing school. So, you know, he's a very interesting person. He was very interested in the anatomic body. And let me show you some of his uh, works. Well, first of all, this beautiful, and again, you don't need to look at the religious part if you don't want to. But uh, here, I want you to look at the, chill. it's called the Children of the Shell um, from 1670. I, I want you to take a look at the harmony of this painting, at the, at the colors, at the nature around, at, at, at the lamb, of course, and also how, uh, uh, how Jesus, here's Jesus, of course, Jesus is giving the water to St. John the Baptist. Remember that I told you John the Baptist has always the fur of a lamb as a dress. So, but notice here is Jesus Christ giving him the water, not the other way around. So I admire that. Let me show you a close-up. Here you can see how delicate the lines are, how beautiful the skin, how, how delicate the hair of both uh, children. No? I, I want to focus on that and I want you to admire those colors. And uh, notice how the pinks go into the beige and go into the white without a border. So, sort of what Leonardo had done with the lips of the of the Gioconda. I pass from one color to the other without the limits. That's that's the masterpiece of uh, uh, the, the master management of uh, Murillo in these paintings. Now, Murillo was also a very intense painter, painting a lot of Virgin Marys. Virgin Mary is going to be like his topic, right? And like his expertise, you know, we would say his, uh, his line of business was uh, uh, portraits of the Virgin Mary or, or paintings of the Virgin Mary. And I want you to take a look at something very special. Uh, different to other painters, Murillo's uh, virgins are always 
staring somewhere else. If you notice, they are not watching at the spectator. So her eyes are not focusing on you. They are focusing, of course, on God. So we as mortals, we are not allowed to see God, but she is allowed to see God. So she is always looking some, some, somewhere else. She's looking to a higher point. Look at this also. Look how beautiful the face is. And again, uh, don't, don't necessarily look at the religious part, but look at the perfection of the face, how delicate the lips are, how the eyes go always to the top, the eyebrows and the hair. Look how the hair falls around here. This is also very nice and delicate. This is what I want you to admire. And sometimes also Virgin Mary is floating, right? It's not necessarily connected to the ground, but it's floating and uh, sustained by these angels, sustained by a cloud, sometimes by the moon, and always looking to the top. Now, a little bit of art for Murillo. Now let's do the reverse uh, engineering. And let me show you what I see here. And I hope that you're not shocked, but I cannot avoid uh, and think of uh, when I see all this beauty, when I see all this del delicacy of the environment, I can, of course, not think of sustainability. Sustainability in the sense that nature is respected, preserving the delicate, because environment is very delicate, our world, our earth is very delicate, so respecting and caring caring for the sensibilities, caring for those around us, caring for the community, caring for the environment, caring for the climate change. For me, that this, this is like, a, like a, uh, something that reminds me that, of course. And, and, and once again, of course, I would never say that this is what Murillo wanted to do, by no means. What I'm saying is I just get reminded when I, when I look at this and when I think of the things that we need to do at work. No? So for me, again, this is like, uh, makes me think of sustainability because look at the fragility, look at the delicate touch with nature, with environment, uh, with the most fragile. Look how Murillo, you know, um, he could be used also like, a, almost like a sense of sustainability. Uh, notice also that uh, sustainability means leadership. Leadership, because here is Jesus making the message and not not giving the water, giving the baptism, sort of the baptisms, and not the other way around. So this also means sustainability, meaning a, a way of leadership, me, being a way of being the leaders. Now the eyes of the Virgin Mary, you can probably imagine what I what I see there when I think of sustainability. I what I, I think is long-term objectives that not everybody can see. So, as you know, many people do not see the value of fighting for some sustainability goals 10 years down the road or 30 years down the road. And many people don't care if they say, you know, the planet is going to warm by two degrees in, in, in 25 years because it's just too far away. So that's also what I think when I see this, the gaze of Virgin Mary so far away in the sky and not necessarily not necessarily connected to what is going on in the day to day what is going on with the earth and yet and yet the goals are very important yet what i'm seeing is very important what i'm seeing long term is very important so that makes me think a little bit about sustainability in that way now let me change and go to goya who i i think you know very well goya is a very special uh, character Goya is Rococo, is neoclassic, is uh, romanticism, uh, but again, is uh, naturalism. No? Uh, he has been influenced by Tiepolo, by Rubens, by Velázquez, and he is a, a thematic painter. So he would take like an ar like an argument and develop that argument in many paintings. And so uh, he was deaf. He was completely deaf, uh, uh, and uh, that that made him live very towards his interior, towards the inside. And he is. Um, he also traveled to Italy. Got influence from Veronese, from Raffaello, and uh, he has all that. And he produced a lot. He produced more than 500 oil paintings. Uh, if if anybody uses oils to paint, you know that it takes a lot longer than, for example, if you use acrylics. 
uh, all my painting is these days in acrylics, but you know, when I started many, many years ago, I was using oils and it takes ages to dry and to wash the brushes and so, and imagine to create 500 pieces in a lifetime. And of course the size is very significant. So now let me tell you about the, the first, the, the, the joyful, the joyful um, paintings of uh, Goya. And I want to focus especially on these beautiful paintings that are on the on the third floor of the Prado, or the second floor if you count it, the basement as a basement. Uh, this painting, for example, is a beautiful painting called El Pelele. What I want you to see is the harmony of this uh, painting, the beauty of it. Everything is perfect. We are playing there uh, in the countryside. It is sunny and it's you know like a child play. We have some rules, but you know this is about having fun. Or this painting here, for example, is called uh, La Gallina Ciega, which means the, the blind hen. You know, I cannot see, I play. Look how I don't get dirty, right? My super nice white silk shoes do not get dirty, if, even if I'm playing outside. Why? Because life is so perfect and we are all rich and aristocratic, so we can play and we can enjoy and, and we can be there, you know, with our friends and we can enjoy the, the 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 wine that is going to be produced here and everything is beautiful and so right enjoying nature enjoying the the landscape enjoying the sunshine and then and then all of a sudden something a little bit funny a couple of cats fighting on a ceiling and yet you know curious nice naive maybe hmm or a dog that is semi sunk sinking Oh, the dog is there watching at us and he's like sinking. And of course, the very famous Maja Vestida and Maja Desnuda. So the, la the dress lady, um, uh, allow me that translation, the dress lady and the, dr and, and the naked lady painted, uh, painted uh, 200 years ago. Imagine this painting uh, 200 years ago. So this woman, let me tell you about the woman. Uh, this woman is not a mythical goddess or a theoretical woman. This, this was a real woman. Um, some say that is Cayetana, the Duchess of Alba. Some others say it's Pepita Ludo, uh, who was Manuel Godoy's lover uh, and uh, uh, who was a, a lover of the Prime Minister of Charles uh, IV. And look, look at these paintings. Look at these paintings. Now, let me tell you that the Maja has real dimensions, uh, according to the woman that she's supposed to be representing for both the waist and the breast, but the face, the face has been sort of uh, changed a little bit to protect the, um, the, um, the, to, so that they could not identify her to, pro to protect the, the, the person, right? And nevertheless, news, news filtered, news filtered, and everybody then suddenly was saying, oh, uh, the Cayetana was painted naked. And then what they did to correct that is that instead of denying it, so they decided not to deny it, they said, no, let's paint a new one, identical, but dressed. And they put that up on the living room. So everybody said, oh, oh is it true that they painted you naked? And they said, no, they painted me there. That, that, there is a painting. And that way they sort of handled the truth, right? So those are the beautiful, some of the beautiful paintings by Goya. Now, let me tell you, what I see in these paintings that can teach us some lessons for the uh, corporate world. First of all, in this childish place, there are, of course, rules. This means, you know, yes, we are kids, we are playing, yes, but we are following some rules. And for me, this reminds me of ethics because we play, yeah, but we want to play within a framework. We want to play fair. And when I say uh, ethics, I not only mean the legal part, hold on, eh? not only the legal, because as you know, ethics go beyond the legal. So I need to do the legal, of course, but more than that, I need to care for the higher values. I need to respect for those values. No? It's like, for example, in this game, uh, when I am playing the blind hand, of course it's playing, but I could cheat. I could cheat if I wanted. Mm -hmm. Yet being ethical is precisely not cheating, even if I can. So even if the others have the eyes covered, I can play ethically because I choose to be ethical. And that is the point of it. That is the beauty of, of ethics. That is, it's not law. It's way more than law. 
is really acting because you want to be ethical. Now, uh, what else is ethics for me? You know, for me, acting ethically also means caring for those less fortunate than us. Being ethical for me requires us to look beyond the official duty, my official obligations, and consider if and how we could do a greater good. Not only do good, but do a greater good. And why do I bring this painting here? Because I want you, I want you to focus on the two guys here in the background. Do you see these two guys in the background? Well, let me make a close up. The two guys in the background are not rich, as you can tell from their dresses and as you can tell because they are working, working strongly. And take a look at how they, one of them is, one of them keeps working. So maybe resignated to his condition, he keeps working. But the other one, the other one looks at the rich family and maybe wishes to be like them, maybe wishes to have money like that, maybe wishes to be in that condition and wear those clothes. And I am left behind, I am back there. Well, folks, that for me is ethics. Acting ethically also means caring for those less fortunate than us. Being ethical, somebody has the microphone open, maybe you can close it. Ethical, acting ethically means also caring for those less fortunate than us. And being ethical requires us to go as I said, beyond the, beyond the obligation and care for those that are maybe less uh, benefited than us. Now, what else do I see here in these fights, for example? For me, these two cats clearly represent also corporate fights. You know, many times in the companies, in the organizations where we work, we have fights, absurd, time-consuming, unnecessary, unproductive fights, just like cats on the roof. I want to make my argument. I want to win my argument. No, I want to win my argument. And we fight like cats on the floor. Well, for me, being ethical also means preventing, really preventing and solving conflict. Uh, not, not entering into the conflict, but really making an effort to solve it. And the point is, well, how can we as auditors help and, and try to avoid those conflicts? Because when you are, uh, you are as, uh, as an auditor, you many times will be confronted with that. You many times will be confronted with stakeholders' interests, with clients' interests, and you say, how do I balance this between the orders that I should follow, the methodology that I should follow, and what I find here? How do I handle that? Well, that's precisely your challenge here, folks. I know you have very strict rules. I know the work of auditor is super difficult, and that is exactly the point. How do I balance it? So next time you are confronted with a situation, think of Goya. And remember the two, the two uh, silly cats fighting on the floor and say to yourself, is there anything that I could do to avoid or at least to reduce the importance of this fight? How do I as auditor go and make of that fight something lighter? Think of Goya, remember Goya. Or think of Goya also here because being ethical also means caring for the least represented one. Minority interest, for example or it means considering all stakeholders, considering the, the minorities and their interests, asking yourself, could anybody get affected by my actions? Could my actions damage or impact anybody? Could I do something for that little dog who is thinking? Do I have the power to do that? Maybe not, maybe I don't have all the power. Maybe I need to follow strict rules that limit me and so I know, but at least maybe you can try, or at least you maybe can remember Goya and take it with you. I know, I know that I am saying extreme things that might not fit you completely, but now let me tell you this one about the Maha. Well, the Maha, what, what do I bring the Maha? Because the Maha is like naked, naked true, right? When you go and do the audits, many times you find naked evidence there that is, oh God, listen what I just found. Sometimes uh, you need to be careful as to who do you give that information to? How do you handle the truth? So, of course, you are going to handle the truth, but how do you manage, uh, for example, delicate information? How do you act when confronted, for example, with a strong revelation? What is your professionalism? Uh, because your professionalism sometimes is put to the test before such occasions, and being ethical is also learning to handle these, uh, these, uh, these situations. Being ethical for me also means carefully handling the truth, disclosing only what's most necessarily to those whom is mo most needed only, and maybe uh, asking for instructions from the top 
uh, how shall we handle this? Eh? How shall we handle the Maha Desnuda if I suddenly found, found one? So these are some lessons from Goya, from the joyful part. Now, let me go to Goya, the black part, because there's also the black part, of course. Here you see Saturn devouring the kid. Uh, see how brutal it is. Here you see the fight. Uh, it's called the fight of the 3rd of May. You see somebody pointing at someone and killing him. You see a couple of uh, people having a vision, a fantastic vision of a city being destroyed with a calamity coming to the other city. You know, you see the calamity here going into that city and these two people seeing it from away. Oh, so bad, so dark. Or here you see a group of people terrorized because uh, they are going to die. And here this guy represents the dead. Or you can see it also here. See how dark Goya can be. Of course, a master, but very dark. Or here, cutting the line of um, cutting the line of your life. You know, very very dark things, very strong things. And this this is the strongest one for me. It's called Mortal Fight, Duelo a Muerte in Spanish. It's two people fighting, and it's either you or I. Somebody needs to die. Somebody must die. And look at the legs. The legs are in the hay. They cannot freely move. I rather kill you because otherwise you are going to kill me. Right? Very strong. So what lessons do we, get, do we take from this black part of Goya? Well, let me try to show you a little bit of lessons from this part of Goya. Well, first of all, the brutal confrontation of the truth, the brutal confrontation of the facts that you might find while doing your audit. But also, like these two people looking at the calamity happening somewhere else, well, sometimes you as auditors will see bad things coming. You will see them from a long version and you might see them from calamity, you might see the calamity going. Well, as an auditor, you sometimes see that calamity, but to some degree, you see it from the distance, you see it from away. Now, the word here that I find is accountability. Accountability, because accountability means that I also feel responsible and that I also take self-assumption of the problematic and that I involve myself and that I try to engage myself and go and help that city that I have just audited or, or where I found the calamity going to. That's a little bit the point of uh, accountability there. Accountability there also in the fact that if people, uh, if, if people do bad, well, they need to face their destiny, right? And we need to take that uh, with responsibility. Uh, accountability, you know, uh, in the sense that the, the actions of life, the sins of life, can have consequences, can have uh, repercussions. And here, for example, here is for me a beautiful painting because it combines accountability, but also ethics combined. The question is, these fighters, one must kill the other. The question here is, is auditing a win-lose game? When I go and do an audit, do I need to kill the other or I get killed? Well, in my version of things, my version of things is, it is not, should never be a zero-sum game, should be a win-win game, and we as auditors should be able to create. Even if there's fights, we should be able to create, we should be able to develop something. We are not with our legs in the sand. That's, that's a little bit the point. Now, let me go to the last one, Velázquez, so that we can open it up for questions in the end. Velázquez, very quickly, 1599, 1660, the most uh, impressive uh, painter of Spain. Uh, to most of the people. Let me show you very quickly here the, what is called Apollo in the Forge of uh, Vulcan. Uh, uh, and you can tell here, well, here there is the god Apollo coming to where Vulcan is working. So this is Vul Vulcan working here and with his team. So you can see the team there. And uh, uh, Apollo comes to tell him simply that um, his wife um, uh, is having an affair with Mars. So he, the wife is, uh, is uh, Venus and uh, Venus is having an affair with Mars. So bringing bad news and how he listens to that. Take a look artistically. Take a look at how uh, the masterpiece of, uh, of um, Velázquez, who learned from Caravaggio, you can admire him very clearly, how the muscles are perfectly drawn. The arms and the legs are separated from each other, so they don't need to support and, and hide anything because he masters painting muscles. He masters completely painting a back or an abs or a biceps or a triceps. That's the, the perfection of Velázquez and the light, of course. Now, the Meninas is the most famous of all the paintings of Velázquez, occupies the most central point 
in the Museum del Prado. And you can see here uh, the master Velázquez self-portrait. And of course, there is uh, th this has created a lot of influence. Picasso created his own version. Many, many artists have created versions of the Meninas. There's a huge explanation that you can, I mean, I, we don't have the time, but there's a huge explanation that tells you who is who in these paintings. You can find it in Wikipedia very easily. So it's interesting if, if, if you want to learn who the different characters are. Uh, we only have question about number eight. We are not sure about that, but in any case, it's interesting to see. It. Now, uh, before we wrap it up and open up for questions, let me tell you that, uh, let me close by bringing you my favorite. So my favorite of all, all is the surrender of Breda, which is what we uh, used to open the conference. It's called, uh, also known as the Spears. The spear, of course, are these spears up here. And see how beautiful this painting is. Look at the balance. Let me show you a, a, the colors and the balance, the horse. You can see here, this is Velázquez here in self-portrait. And he, this is representing Ambrogio Spinola. This is Ambrogio Spinola. Ambrogio Spinoli receiving the, the, the keys of the, of the city of Breda from, uh, from Coronel Nassau, who has been defeated. So the Spanish, who are these folks here, the Spanish have won the war and have conquered, uh, have conquered uh, Breda. So these are the losers, these are the winners. And I want to show you a close up. And with it, I want to wrap up our conference by asking you to look at these two characters. These two characters for me summarize the whole thing because the uh, Ambrogio Spinola, so the winner, take a look at how Ambrogio Spinola, the winner, he is conscious that he has won, but he treats the loser with complete respect, even with a bit of love. Take a look at the way he stares at Nassau. And Nassau, he knows he has lost he recognizes and gives the keys to the city, but the winners, take also a look at the other faces, the winners are conscious of their victory, but are fully respectful to the other, are fully accountable what they are doing and are fully committed and they have worked in teamwork to win this battle, real gentlemen, exactly, and they are acting as that. Well, for me, that is a summary of the whole thing. Let me erase that for you so that you can take uh, another look at this beautiful painting. And this is my favorite of all the Prado Museum. And I will, with that, summarize to you and tell you that for me, at the center of ethics of the five values that Alfonso de la Fuente introduced, for me, at the center of his is ethics. This one, folks, this, you can manage it, you can control it, and it connects with the other four, teamwork, accountability, and sustainability. But at the heart is ethics, and you, are and you know how to handle this. So with that, let me close it up. It's exactly 12.30. So I will close it up for questions or comments. And then at the end, I would like to make a couple of announcements for you of other conferences that I have. So Alfonso, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. It was really a very interesting and nice conference. And now I'm, I'm going to start um, with the debate. Oh, so please, I... Um, I ask everybody to use actively the chat, and I will first like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Milionis, which uh, I know he has some questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, I also know that in the audience we have um, uh, Dr. Rocher from the, um, the School of uh, Business of uh, Nancy University, who is mm -hmm. also an expert in art. And I own also that uh, we have uh, Monsieur Casala, uh, Le, Le Monde Francais de la, de, la, de la Cour de Comptes, who is also following issues on, on art. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I will ask them all to try to participate in this debate. Mr. Milionis, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alfonso. Uh, it was very stimulating presentation indeed. Thank you for that. Uh, um, you. you have shown uh, with uh, a lot of talent that art can be used as a tool of communication. Uh, it can be very powerful and bring people to think uh, out, to think out of the box, uh, to think uh, as you said, a little bit cra with a little bit crazy. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have an interesting uh, example uh, here in the court in our 
court uh, corridor uh, with um, a current exhibition of artistic photos uh, around the theme of handicaps and inclusion. Yeah. Uh, as as you know, uh, we uh, we are now working on a new ECA art uh, policy. Would you have some advice uh, to give us on how art can be used to pass messages? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Well, I think uh, the a, a little bit I touched on that when I was showing uh, this slide. Uh, that um, and the, the message for me is um, respect and caring for the maybe less fortunate. Uh, so respect um, in the most extreme, um, the most extreme um, driver of respect for me uh, is actually love behind. So human love and love for the for the others channel through respect will result in uh, in inclusion and of course in accepting the diversity of others and of course in accepting any anybody who has uh, less uh, reduced capacities so anybody who might be um, disabled in any way either physically or, or mentally or any other how uh, respect for me is the 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 driver that will allow and will allow us to uh, create a harmonic uh, um, interchange and exchange uh, with other people that who are, as you say, might have less uh, fortunate uh, situations. That's uh, one of the things that I would say. Uh, and I also think that this other painting by Goya represents this very well. No? So the, 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 the perro semi hundido, which means semi semi sunk uh, dog. So maybe some people don't are not out there, are not with all their capacities, are not with all their strengths, and yet we need to take care of them. That that would I maybe uh, use as a mnemotechnic to remember it, uh, Mr. Milan. It's back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ye yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Rick. If if uh, if I may, because um, a little bit uh, going further on, on on this subject, you know that there are some academics uh, that that the thing that the using using an artwork to talk about a subject uh, like we were doing today. I know you were making clearly the distinction, but some people may consider that this is a kind of a, of a manipulation because you are appropriating yourself of the of the artwork. Um, of the uh, of the message that maybe the author wanted to express uh, something mm -hmm. else that you don't know, mm -hmm. and uh, you are using it uh, for your own vision, like kind of a manipulation. However, there are other scholars that uh, see the art as a tool, as an opportunity to be used, like we were saying, uh, for a number of, for a number of uh, of different uh, purposes. Right. I, I see it as an like a Swiss knife. Um, art can be a Swiss knife with the different tools that you can pull out when you need for different management purposes. I would like um, maybe that to see your your vision about about this subject. What what do you think about this? Well, that's that's of course a very interesting question, Alfonso. Thank you for that. And it's uh, it's not easy to answer, but let me try to tell you a couple of things. So. Um, you, you use the verb to appropriate uh, something from the artist. Well, um, you know, let me tell you that. Let me talk to you now, not as a a speaker, but as as as, as a painter. I, I've been painting for many years, and you know, the the thing is, when you create a painting, uh, once you put it out, then then it's not more yours, <laughs> right? Because you know, truth is in the eye. Uh, I mean, beauty is in on the eye of the of the of the beholder. And uh, the moment I put up a canvas out there, uh, I I sort of don't don't own it anymore. And it is up to the viewers to uh, like it or not like it, admire it or, or not admire it, or be against or be against my interpretation. You know, uh, I, it could be, of course, that I have an initial meaning in mind. It can, and and that is the official interpretation of the painter of course but it might be that when you look at it you find something else and I think art is about discovering for me art is 
yes, about communicating. So it's a one way from the painter to the viewer, but it's a two way avenue. It's a two way street. You might understand and you might find and feel something different when you see that painting. And that is in, in a way coming back to the piece of art. So, you know, for me, there is not a conflict. There would be, of course, a conflict if people say, if, if, I, if I were to say, you know, this painting, with this painting, Goya wanted to talk about accountability. That, of course, would be a lie more than, not only a mistake, but a lie, uh, which, of course, we don't intend to do here. Well, I, I, what I'm trying to give you is a little bit of a, really like mnemotechnia, something that you can easily remember, you know, that you can take from, from this and that you can take it with you. And then maybe when next time you get into a fight, you think of the two, two cats, or next time you, you see some minority disinterest being affected, you think of the dog, you know, that kind of things. More importantly, if you, as, as I was uh, saying no, uh, in the, uh, uh, towards the end, if you can take with you an image like this one, like this one, and if you can appropriate, I invite you to appropriate of this image and derive of it whatever is best for you. You know, I focus a lot on Spinola. Uh, but you might find it maybe more interest, uh, the gentleman here at the back, you might find yourself maybe uh, that you play from this position, you know. Uh, this is like in sports, we all play different sp different positions in a team. Uh, some play the middle field, some play the, the front runners. Well, you might identify yourself with different parts, but what I do invite you all is to really extract, extract more from art than only the beauty, which is beautiful and deserves admire from an only artistic point of view. But then you can do the reverse engineering technique and go and try to pick something out of it. Back to you, Alfonso. Yes, uh, thank you, Rick. The, the, the chat is really animated and I have uh, different people who want to intervene. I would like first to give the, the floor to Mr. Casala, the, um, the, the, the French member, who was um, already asking uh, to uh, to put you some questions. Uh, okay. Monsieur Casala, est-ce que vous pouvez peut-être uh, allumer votre caméra? Et, uh, voilà, et le, et le son aussi. Et vous pouvez directement poser la question à, à Monsieur Avec. Serrano. Bonjour. Oui, bonjour. Euh, bonjour. Alors, je, vais le faire, je vais le faire en français puisque il n'y a, a pas de, de problème avec Monsieur Serrano que je remercie beaucoup pour euh, pour cet exposé. Alors euh, Alfonso, vous m'avez pris un peu par surprise parce que je ne mm -hmm. voulais pas euh, intervenir particulièrement. J'ai pas de titre euh, particulier à le faire. Euh, sinon, effectivement, que euh, comme mon collègue Nikos euh, et comme d'autres collègues d'ailleurs, euh, euh, j'ai bien sûr un intérêt de d'amateur euh, pour, pour l'art et la peinture en particulier. Euh, il se trouve en plus que si tout se passe bien, j'irai, s'il n'y a pas de problème de Covid ou autre, euh, je, je vais essayer d'aller au Prado entre, euh, entre Noël et le jour de l'an. Mais euh, muni, muni de ces informations, ça me permettra de voir les peintures euh, d'un autre œil peut-être. Mais euh, en fait, euh, c'est surtout le, la question que vous avez posée à l'instant, Alfonso, et la réponse de, de M. Serrano, qui m'a beaucoup intéressé euh, et, et qui me, 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 me conduise à faire en fait un commentaire. Je n'ai pas de question à proprement parler, mais je voulais euh, effectivement confirmer, et ce n'est pas seulement vrai de la peinture, c'est aussi vrai de la musique, c'est aussi vrai de la littérature, hein, Umberto Eco l'a démontré, qu'à partir du moment où un créateur ou une créatrice livre un, un produit de sa création, il n'en est plus le maître. Euh, il n'en est plus le maître et quelles que soient les intentions que lui ou elle avait derrière cette création, euh, et qu'il faut connaître aussi, hein, je voudrais aussi oui. insister sur ce point, il ne faut pas non plus, euh, je crois qu'il est important aussi de le savoir, mais euh, en dehors de ça ou au-delà de ça, l'intérêt de, de l'œuvre, c'est précisément d'avoir cet effet de stimulation, euh, au-delà de l'émotion même, de l'imagination de celui qui l'écoute, euh, qui, qui la regarde, euh, qui la lit, euh, et, et, et ce qui apporte, à mon avis, une, une incontestable valeur ajoutée euh, de la création artistique par rapport à tout autre euh, 
euh, activités, y compris écrire des rapports d'audit. Ce n'est pas forcément là que, euh, que l'on retrouve le même type de, de stimulation. Donc, je voulais... Euh, je, 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 je remercie M. Serrano d'avoir précisé, parce que, euh, emporté par le discours, on pouvait parfois penser le contraire, qu'effectivement, il n'a pas voulu dire que euh, euh, Velasquez a voulu euh, réaliser un tableau sur l'accountability ou, euh, ou Zorbaran sur l'éthique, euh, que sais-je. Ça, c'est euh, euh, peut-être peut aller un petit peu trop loin, mais en revanche, que le spectateur euh, ou l'auditeur ou le lecteur euh, soit stimulé euh, dans ce sens-là, ça me paraît une, une, idée, euh, une idée assez bonne. Voilà, ce n'était pas vraiment une, une question et un commentaire. Et sans négliger, sans négliger je, 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 je pense que c'est aussi un apprentissage, mais sans négliger euh, le fait d'essayer de savoir si on le peut, euh, vous parliez de lire euh, à travers les lignes, mais il y a aussi les lignes que l'on peut lire elles-mêmes, mais parfois elles Absolument. sont <rire> explicites, notamment pour la peinture religieuse, dont il y avait beaucoup ouais. d'exemples. De, euh, ou si, si je prends un tableau qui n'est pas très agréable pour les Français, le 13 de Mayo de, de, de Goya, ouais, ouais. Euh, où là c'est une référence à, à un fait historique euh, qui crée l'émotion en tant que telle, je crois qu'il est aussi important d'avoir cette lecture euh, qui est plus que, que littéral ou plus qu'immédiate, qu euh, qui nécessite parfois d'aller un petit peu au fond en termes de symbolique ou en termes de connaissances historiques, et ça demande un petit, euh, un petit effort quand même. Voilà, moi je voulais féliciter surtout M. Serrano pour son, euh, pour son propos, que j'ai trouvé très fluide et très, très stimulant et, et plein, de, plein, de, plein de promesses de ce point de vue-là. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, M. Casal. Vous avez absolument raison. Ça qu'on a fait aujourd'hui ou qu'on a essayé de faire aujourd'hui avec la peinture, on peut le faire naturellement avec les autres beaux-arts, c'est clair. Et merci de votre commentaire. Et si vous avez un programme, une visite à El Prado, n'hésitez pas à me contacter. Je peux vous donner encore plusieurs des informations. Naturellement, aujourd'hui, on n'avait qu'une heure. Mais si vous êtes intéressé, je peux vous donner beaucoup plus d'informations pour et planifier votre visite. Merci. Merci, Eric. C'est de la valeur ajoutée, ça. <rire> Alphonse, Donc, euh, to... Oui, s'il te plaît, parce que um, we have a lot of people still asking the questions. Yeah. And, um, and uh, I know you want to do a couple of announcements at, at, at the very end. Of, um, well, before that, um, I don't know, because some people might go for lunch before. Uh, you tell me when. Okay, but before you do the announcements, I would like to give the floor to um, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Rocher from the University yeah. of, uh, of La Lorraine, mm -hmm. who has a very interesting question. And I don't want to read his question. I want that he directly uh, puts his question. So, Monsieur Rocher, si vous pouvez ouvrir votre caméra et directement poser la, la, la question. Allô? Uh, bon. Uh, Alphonse, I'm, I'm really sorry, uh, and, and I'm really sorry, Mr. Serrano, because I, I can't open my camera right now. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. Sebastian, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, as I wrote it, I really appreciated your idea of art as a communication too. Um, but I was very uh, interested by um, Mr. De La Fuente's question. So I have uh, another one, and I think it is in the in the, in the same state of mind, uh, according to you, uh, can't art also be a way to contradict an institutional message? Because if you can build a message, why can't you, let's say, um, try to present things a little bit differently right. based on art? And in this particular case, according to you, uh, how to overcome such uh, situation? You, do you mean from the standpoint of uh, maybe superiors in an organization, from, from, from authorities? Well, well, why not? Uh, well, it, it could be a case, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I mean, well, uh, so just someone who, is, uh, who, who just disagree with, let's say, uh, an, institutional, an institutional message, whatever the message, and try to make his or her point uh, based on art. Um, How do you overcome such a situation? I mean, well, well, yeah, that's a very interesting question, Sebastian. Thank you for that. You know, um, it would be very interesting, actually, that that dialogue it, it develops. 
and that uh, if I bring an argument with a couple of uh, paintings, uh, somebody else brings a different view with others, uh, that would be fantastic because you would be actually creating dialogue. Um, that if, if handled correctly, doesn't necessarily need to be destructive. It can be constructive in my view. No? So I could, I could try to support some values uh, evoking some pieces of art and you could be trying to contradict me or trying to prove me wrong with others is perfectly valid. You know, I, 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 I'm sure that you will agree with me that art is, the beauty of art is that there is no right or wrong. There is a dialogue. There is a, the openness to say, uh, I see it differently. That's uh, the openness to say, you know, that might be your interpretation. Mine is different. And then, but still we can dialogue, still we can talk without fighting. No? So I, I agree that the, the contrast could be, could, could arise, of course. Uh, but I think that the contrast is not necessarily destructive. It could even be creative. That would be my, I, 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 my answer to you, Sebastian. Okay, so thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Alfonso. Oui, euh, merci, merci Sebastian pour cette intervention. Et, euh, Rick, I don't know if you want to profit this moment to make these uh, announcements because I know it's yeah. the lunch time. People want to go for the lunch. We already exceeded by 20 minutes oh. the time we, we, we were given. Okay. I know it uh, has been very interesting and uh, people wanted to listen to all this, but maybe it's time to do the announcements and start wrapping yeah. up and again closing. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just make a couple of invitations to all of you. Uh, I would like to invite you to a conference and painting exhibition that is taking place on the 8th of December. Uh, it's something that I have created and I would be very honored if, if you want to join. It's about the painting exhibition called The Limits of Our World and it will take place at the University in Belval. Uh, you will have all the details, but the the, Emeritus, the Rector Emeritus Rolf Tarach will be opening, and Dr. Greg Mine, uh, Georg Mine, who is the head of humanities, will also be talking, as well as Professor Thomas Raleigh. And then I will be presenting a very dynamic, short presentation on Wittgenstein and showing you the paintings of the Tractatus. It's a it's a, an abstract painting exhibition. Uh, you will need this QR code to register. So when you have the PDF, you can simply scan this and register for the talk. That's the first event that I want to invite you to. And the second, uh, this, this is important. Let me tell you why this event is very important. This event is super important because this year, you might not even know who this guy is, and that's okay. You might not even know. But let me tell you, this is the, the second most important philosopher of modern times, and he published a book that was published exactly 100 years ago. So exactly 100 years ago, and the world of culture is celebrating this worldwide. And um, this is a unique event in Luxembourg. I invite you to join it. Uh, we opened it last week at the embassy, at the Austrian embassy, and now it's going to the university. So I invite you to visit us on the 8th and the paintings will remain in Belval for two weeks. So even if you cannot go on the 8th, you can see the paintings the following two weeks. So that's the first event that I would like to invite you to. The second event is the following. You might know that this year we are celebrating the 700 years of the Divine Comedy, the most important book of the Italian language uh, written by Dante Alighieri. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> let me correct that. We're celebrating 700 years of the death of Dante, uh, of the death of Dante, writer of the Divine Comedy. And uh, we are uh, also, we are the only ones organizing something in Luxembourg. Uh, we are guided by Professor Claudio Cicotti of the Uni Luxembourg. This will be in Kirchberg next, uh, this Friday. And the part that I want, I mean, I want to invite you to everything, but my part, uh, which I think, of course, let me be arrogant for a second, the best one is this part here happening at five o'clock. I will be reciting verses of the Divine Comedy accompanied by my friend Damir Babasik, who will be playing the cello, will be playing uh, Johann Sebastian Bach cello while I recite the uh, verses of the ancient, uh, of, of the Divine Comedy in ancient Italian, but you will have the translation in English and in French. 
So those are the two announcements. And um, yeah, back to you, Alfonso, in case there are more, more questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Rick. Um, well, there is still a lot of people uh, uh, connected to the chat. Mm -hmm. and, and unless uh, anybody wants to intervene, I think it will be time to be closing up. Uh, it's uh, lunchtime. I know people want to go for the lunch. And uh, I think that it was really very interesting, uh, your, your confidence, and I mean it, because uh, it's allowing us to talk about subjects that we are interested in at it, but for coming at it from a different angle. So it makes it quite, quite easy to follow, quite interesting. And at the same time, we're treating these subjects that we, we need to discuss about them. So thank you very much. And I hope that we will be able to organize some other events in the future. Also, uh, maybe using art as a conducting tool to talk about different subjects. So thank you very much and thank you all the participants and uh, I wish you all um, a nice lunch and uh, now that uh, we are almost in the Christmas season, I wish you all also a very uh, happy Christmas season. Thank, thank you very you. much, uh, Professor Rick Serrano. Thank you very much, Mr. Milionis, for your support and your participation. Thank mm -hmm. you also to our co colleague uh, Dimitrios uh, for his enthusiasm. And uh, thank you all of you for helping us to organize uh, these kind of events here at the court, which I all think right. are quite useful. Thank you very much, Alfonso. And thank you also, Dimitri and Mil Mr. Miloni. It has been really an honor uh, and a privilege for me to be here. And also thank you to the more than 50 viewers that we had. Uh, really thank you for your openness. And uh, I invite you to follow me and uh, everything that you would like us to discuss, uh, just reach out and I'm, I'm, I'm here. I will be happy to, to touch base with any of you. Thank you once again uh, to the ECA and to you, Alfonso, for organizing this. You're welcome. Thank you to all of you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye.